Good evening and welcome to the July 13th, 2015 Town Council meeting. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, and we'll ask for the roll call from the town clerk. Chairman Ray. Here. Councilor Grennan. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor McCausland. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor Wagner. Present. And Councilor Walsh. Thank you very much, and we'll move on to the town council reports and correspondence. Um, is there anybody who wants to give a report? For now? Nope. We'll have more later, so thank you. All right, the Finance Committee report. Uh, there's a link to the year-end preliminary finance, financial reports. Michael, did you want to add anything? Uh, just very briefly, uh, we do have the appropriate control report, the revenue control report for June 30. Uh, they aren't quite the year-end because there's still uh, some uh, accruals that need to be applied, but overall, it had a very good fiscal year. Uh, people are buying cars. Uh, the excise tax mm -hmm. income in June was the highest it's ever been in any given month. Wow. So the, the wow. folks in the office were very busy and people's checkbooks were busy. So uh, anyway, uh, it also, uh, you know, the well, we had like gift shop sales, which we were nervous about, ended up exceeding the budget by $11,000. Uh, so that was good news. So overall, a good fiscal year. Thank you. Any questions for Michael? No. Okay. Then we will move on to citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. Is there anybody here to talk to us about some, something that's not on the agenda tonight? Okay. Seeing nobody, I will move on to the town manager's monthly report. Yeah. In, in the spirit of the brevity of the evening, I will join the others and uh, pass this evening. Uh, but just to you know, indicate all the projects going well, libraries going well, a lot of paving's gone ha happened. Uh, uh, yeah. Just uh, an awful lot going on. We have a couple of big events coming up. Uh, one that we didn't plan, which is the tall ship event this mm -hmm. coming uh, weekend, which we're very nervous about. Uh, expect a lot of traffic and a lot of cars. The weather forecast looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, the park in that end of the town, particularly on Saturday afternoon, is going to be overburdened uh, considerably. Uh, Beach to Beacon's coming up. Uh, the departments are helping out uh, little odds and ends on that, although it's mostly done by volunteers and the Beach to Beacon organization. And the 250th anniversary committee is very much looking forward to the uh, night at the light, and tickets for that are still available online at eventbrite.com, B-R-I-T-E, eventbrite.com. So uh, hopefully that'll uh, sell out. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, then we'll move on to the review of the draft minutes of the June 15th, 2015 meeting. Is there a motion to accept? Oh, I'm sorry, Jessica? I move that we accept the uh, draft minutes of the June 15, 2015 Town Council meeting. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Molly. Discussion, errors, omissions? I do. Yes. I've, I've actually got, um, I'd like to make a, an amendment to, and ask that you make an amendment to the minutes to reflect two changes under the, um, the policy that I brought forth um, for the um, the use policy for the library, um, specifically um, under rules of conduct, it's in the minutes. Um, there were just two basic typos that were not reflected in the minutes. And under rules of conduct, line three, um, we changed no phone comes to zones. Um, and then under public access to computers, um, the third line from the bottom of the paragraph, it's just that um, to reflect that instead of 10 cents per copy, I think the library wishes to make it 15 cents per page. And everything else in that is a correct um, reflection. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have a problem with those changes? Okay. Great. All in favor? Okay. Thank you very much. 
Um, then we'll move on to item 86, which is the recommendation from the firing range committee. And before we do that, I will ask if there's anybody in the audience that wants to speak to the council about this. Yes, sir. Please come up to the uh, podium. State your name and your address. Good evening. My name is Ed Nadeau, and I live at 9 Apple Tree Lane. Um, Kathy Klein is one of the representatives in the Fire and Range Committee, and I believe you received a request from her to um, defer scheduling the public hearing until after the uh, Fire and Range Safety Committee that the town has commissioned, until you get the results, and those results can be properly reviewed. Because um, uh, as a, a number of individuals, we, we do have some concerns yet about the recommendations and the approval of the application. But we think some of those may and probably should be resolved by the firing range safety inspection. If that's the case, then we'll go, move on. But um, we just look forward to seeing that, and I assume you do too. Obviously, obviously you made the commitment to, to fund it. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Kathy. Yes, my yeah. On that point, Paul Fenton is here who staffs the firing range committee. And he has, I think, an update on the status of where that report is, and maybe this might be, a, you know, not to interrupt the citizens' discussion of the well, item, but uh, if you could you. update on where that report stands, it, it might help others who wish to comment. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I've had uh, two conversations this week with the evaluator. I um, spoke with him this morning, actually, early this morning, um, and he was said he was going to hopefully finish it up by the end of the week. Uh, he was having some problems with um, trying to find the ridge lines and the um, topography online as far as how high they were going. Um, and then I also spoke with him again just minutes ago on my ride here. He was just asking for some update information, but he once again assured me that it would be done by the end of the week. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello. My name is Tammy Walter. I live at 1095 Sawyer Road in Cape. Um, I'm the president of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club. Um, we have spent $38,000 in the last year modernizing our range. In the last two and a half months, we have done an additional $22,000 in range and clubhouse improvements. Our goal is to provide our members and the town of Cape Elizabeth the best and safest shooting facility in Maine. On behalf of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, I'd like to thank the council for all your hard work and dedication. Thank you. Oh, please, hold, please hold applause. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mark Malin. I'm from Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, 1250 Sawyer Road. We're proud to be a part of the fabric of Cape Elizabeth for the last 61 years. The founding members would not recognize the shooting range in its modernized form, and frankly, some of our members who have not been down to the range in the last few years would not recognize it either. We are about 60% finished with our renovations, and we plan on finishing our major upgrades in approximately three years. One of the beautiful things that we notice now is seeing grandchildren of the founding members joining the club. And we are proud to be part of the history of Cape Elizabeth. And we thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No. OK. Then we will move on. Um, I will ask Caitlin to update us on the recommendations of the Fire Ranch Committee. Thank you. Just, we met last month after receiving the application from the Fire Ranch Club. And spent several hours going through it and making sure it was complete. And we went through and found and forwarded you seven findings that we voted on, along with four recommendations that um, had to do with this, mostly after the, safety, the safety evaluation that the town council ordered. Um, some thoughts that the shooting range committee had that we wanted to pass on to you. Um, and those are included in there as well. Other than that, thank you. OK, great. Um, so um, I am looking for then a motion to receive the report that we have received 
and uh, set a public hearing for uh, sometime in the future, August, September, whatever. Um, is there a motion to do so? Caitlin. I would move that we receive the findings and recommendations from the Firing Range Committee and set a public hearing for September 14th. Thank you. Is there a second? Molly? I'll second that. Thank you. Um, discussion? Jamie. Yeah, maybe I direct this to Caitlin. So on the recommendation numbers three and four, um, it said that you recommend the town council consider changing the hours of operation. Does the, the committee have a recommendation? No, we didn't come up with um, a specific recommendation. It was just brought up that it seemed the weekend hours, it could be beneficial to the, the noise levels in the neighborhood if the change in the hours was possible. And that was a vote of three to two. So we included it in the recommendations. Okay. Other questions, comments? Jamie. Just um, on the independent safety evaluator, is that antici anticipated to be a written report? Sorry, what? A written report. Yeah. The, 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 the shooting range didn't hire, the town council the did. Town. I don't know anything about the report. I think Michael indicated Yeah, we, just we, as Paul indicated, we expect to have a written report. He said by the end of the week, but we all know, you know, but as, as soon as we have something, we'll, we'll get it posted online. So. Uh, everyone who wishes to see it can see it. But, uh, you know, again, we haven't seen it yet, so we, we, we're not sure exactly what's in it. But as soon as we have it, we'll post it. Thank you. My understanding is that the safety evaluator is going to submit a report and then present the report. Is that still? Um, are they, they going to present the report? Yeah, it's, you know, now that you've set the date, we would be in touch with him and try to have him present. Thank you. Nope. Molly? Just so I'm clear, so the night of the public hearing, we'd also plan to have the safety evaluation presented and we'd have an opportunity to ask questions of the evaluator. That's right. Okay. And, you know, in, in a, if, if he's not available that particular day, we'd probably be in touch with him of trying to schedule another meeting that, you know, that could occur and everyone would know about it and hear about it. And, uh, you know, I think the important thing is, is, you know, and I've heard very clearly, is the council wishes to have one-on-one -on -one time with him at a public meeting. Right. That one-on-one -on -one is not to cut out anyone else, but it's uh, what I what I mean, face-to-face -face time. I should, should should have used this right. That was why I put it our public hearing for the September 14th, hoping maybe we could get the report and presentation at the August 10th meeting, so that we had a month to digest. Mm -hmm. before the public hearing. Yeah. Daddy. I guess I was having that same feeling with Caitlin, with, uh, knowing that the safety report is going to be available within a week. Um, I would love personally the benefit of having um, a month's digest or have the, hear what the safety valor has to say, especially if you're considering um, you know, some changing hours and things, just to have the full scope of this. I don't know whether it would be at the meeting or at a workshop as a, you know, as a so, potential. I don't want to derail anything, but I think it would be worth it. So, so you know, if the council would like to have him here in August, then uh, uh, Sergeant Fenton will check on his availability. Does that sound like what folks would like, mm -hmm. if he's available? Yeah. But I think the, the real point I'm hearing is you'd like to have it before the public hearing so that everyone has more of a chance to, to hear it and to maybe inform comments at the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. You know, the, just if I might, the other, the other advantage of setting a public hearing having this September is, you know, the council still has this October meeting and its November meeting as, as this council. And, you know, I know there's a desire to finish this uh, during this council year. So that, that sets us up well to, to possibly make a decision, but also to have a, a little bit of flexibility thereafter. Yes, Molly. Yeah, I agree with that, Mike. I think that's important, not just to keep this moving forward, but also because you have a group of seven council members who've been working on this issue and are familiar with it. And we have, I don't know who's re-upping, but we have three positions open for this coming council vote in 
uh, November. So technically or theoretically, I guess we could have four existing council members and three new ones and they'd be coming back up to speed and getting started all over again, correct? Mm -hmm. yes. Jessica. Yeah, I, I think that <clears throat> given that we're, we're, gonna, we're expecting that safety evaluation momentarily by the end of the week, we certainly hope. I see no reason to delay any of this. We'll have plenty of time to review that and we could have a presentation possibly at the August 10 council meeting. And, um, and several of us on the council have been with this issue for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to bring this to its closure. Anybody else have anything? Okay. All in favor of the motion? Thank you. All right, moving on to item 87, which is the report of the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, Brett Seekins here. Yes, sir. Would you like to say a few words? Good evening and thank you. My name is Brett Seekins. I'm the chairman of the Senior Citizen Advisory Commission. It's nice to be back in your chambers to discuss this important issue. My fellow commission members are June O'Neill, William Marshall, Patricia Bradenberg, Elizabeth Braley, Bruce Nelson, and Barbara Page. We are pleased to present you the preliminary report of our year-long study which reviewed the care needs of those in our community age 60 and over. We'd like to thank the town council who set this important study forth. Thank you. In particular, we also thank Councillor James Walsh, who served as our town council li liaison. And we also offer a special thank you to Matt Matthew Sturgis, our staff liaison for his valuable services to the commission. You will note that we have delivered to you a preliminary, prelim preliminary report as the subtle suggestion um, that the discussion needs to be ongoing. Maine is the oldest state in the nation. Maine has the highest percentage of baby boomers, those born in 1946 through 1964, the highest percentage of baby boomers to total population in the nation. Maine is the second highest <coughs> average age workforce in the nation. Those trends will continue over the next 30 years, and they will bring opportunities for community and business development. We took the liberty in our report to provide recommendations to the issues that we, had, that we identified for your consideration. These recommendations are based on our study and the advice and counsel of a number of professional organizations, as well as local and industry experts we sought out. To name a few of the folks that we spoke with, we spoke with the AARP, the main chapter, the main DHHS Office of Aging and Disability Services, the IRIS Network, Southern Maine Agency on Aging, the Independent Transportation Network, Robert Raftus, an elder law attorney with Ainsworth, Thielen, and Raftus, Cape Elizabeth Church officials, and our Cape Elizabeth District Maine State Senator and Representative, among many others. There's a listing in your report. We look forward to discussing this with you more in detail at possibly an upcoming work group session. We understand that uh, something like that will be in development. We believe the issues that we've uncovered and the recommendations we provided will give you a comprehensive, comprehensive affordable platform to springboard actionable, thoughtful policy that will effectively transition our community while enhancing the safety and well-being of our fellow aging neighbors. This is possible through your timely call to action to undertake this study today. While several options, resources, and even grants are available to continue further study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevens. Is there any questions while he is still at the podium? Jessica. I just have a couple comments. Um, I know that <clears throat> I spoke with Council Walsh, to, Walsh today, and he's very sorry he couldn't be here, but he's thrilled with this incredibly comprehensive report. And so that's, it's delightful that, that, that you have completed it, that, that you, your, you and your committee have put all this work into this. And I'm particularly pleased because um, 
for personal reason, which was that looking for our 2014 goals, this was my goal for the council, is that we establish an ad hoc senior advisor, advisory commission to look at the issues in Cape Elizabeth and to bring to the council its comprehensive report and a recommendation on whether or not this should be a permanent committee for the town. So I thank you for all your hard work. This was quite a, quite a long uh, task. There were many, many meetings with many, many hours. And um, I think that this committee has done an incredible job, incredibly comprehensive job of looking at the issues facing our aging population in Cape Elizabeth. So I thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Jessica. Any other questions for Mr. Seekins? Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you. So I will be looking for a uh, motion to acknowledge receipt of the report. And um, we'd also like to look at um, sending this to a workshop. So is anybody? Jessica? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Chairman Ray. I move that we ex <coughs> acknowledge that we accept the report of the Senior Citizens Advisory Committee and uh, refer it to an upcoming town council workshop. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Patty, thank you. Discussion? Oh. All in favor? Great. So we will move on to item 88, um, which is the proposed special events ordinance provision. And I believe Peter Curry is here. Would you be willing to come up and tell us a little bit about that? Excuse me. Good evening. Uh, my name is Peter Curry. I'm chair of the planning board. Uh, you uh, assigned to us the task of looking over and, and reviewing and perhaps developing a uh, zoning ordinance that would accommodate the use of special events in the residential districts for weddings, uh, receptions, this type of light entertainment venue. Uh, there was one uh, case in point that was in that was being done and we thought it'd be useful to use that as a catalyst but not necessarily a guide so you have the ordinance before you uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have in the basics are that we've set up a overlay zoning district much like we do with communications towers so that if a uh, applicant wants to come in and have an area designated as a special event facility uh, zoning ordinance, as there is one now before you, uh, then that can be voted upon by the council, and then the applicant will have to come in for site plan approval for the uh, for the facility. Um, we have a fairly comprehensive list of restrictions that will be uh, applying here. We were quite concerned that the the purpose of the activity, which is, is certainly meritorious, be balanced very carefully with the needs of the surrounding community. And that we uh, go on at some length, hopefully to prevent any uh, obnoxious or uh, use that would really bother the neighborhood. And the, the permitting process for this activity will have a three year lifespan to it. So that if, if for some reason it doesn't work out and the, the surrounding areas are offended by the uses, then it can be brought to a screeching halt. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Curry? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I probably did this out of order, but is there anybody in the audience that wants to speak to us in reference to this uh, proposed special events ordinance provision? Nope. Okay, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Excuse me if you would like to come up to the uh, podium and state your name and your address. Yes. Thank you. Take your time. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Julie Sprague. I live at 7 Odyssey Lane, Cape Elizabeth, 04107. I attended um, Pond Cove Primary. Um, I'm concerned with the ordinance, and I must admit I know nothing about it, um, but I w I'm concerned with the flavor of the intent of governance 
over private land ownership. And I would appreciate if somebody could give me a time and a date to meet with them so they could explain to me what they're trying to accomplish. It seems to me that um, this is infringing on the right and to pursue liberty and happiness on private property. And I would just be w willing to understand. And I don't have any griefs, but I came tonight because any time I read in the paper um, considerations of um, infringements on private ownerships, I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No. Okay. Then um, I would like to um, ask for a motion to refer this to the Ordinance Committee. Um, is there a motion to do so? <coughs> Jessica? I, maybe I should let someone else make that I know. Motion. I was going to. <laughs> Molly? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I looked right and I should have looked left. No, you, I think you looked my way first and I didn't get my hand up there fast enough. And then you went to Jessica. It's okay. Uh, I move to um, recommend that we refer this proposal to the Ordinance Committee for review and recommendation back to the full council. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Patty. <coughs> Any, uh, discussion? No? Okay. Uh, I, I do well, have yes. one question, and I would like to respond to Ms. Sprague's request, or I would like to ask that someone, perhaps it's Michael, would be willing to respond to Ms. Sprague's request for some further information, and I, I will leave that in your hands, to, whether that's this evening or to set up another time to meet. <clears throat> Michael. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'd be happy to respond. The, the special events ordinance it is, is an attempt to, to actually, I think, be permissive. Uh, it, it, under the current ordinance, it, if someone wants to rent out a property anywhere in town for a commercial purpose, uh, they're, they're essentially not allowed to do it. Uh, and in this particular instance, what, what brought this issue up is, is that there was some, there was a, one of the families within the Spray Corporation uh, land area uh, began to rent out a space uh, and a, a cottage uh, for, for large weddings and other special events. Uh, the building inspector said that wasn't allowed and we've, we've worked with the corporation uh, to try to find a way to, to uh, accommodate such uses. The, the planning board then looked at it and they looked at, you know, well we're not just going to do this for the Spray Corporation, we need to look at this on a community-wide basis. And that's what they've done. They've looked at summer lots. And, you know, anyone can, can have a wedding on their property. Uh, anyone can do it. And with this ordinance, is it up to four times, I think? Uh, so you can do it so many times without having to get all these extra permissions. But it, if you're in the, the regular business of having an activity center on, on one's property, that you're, that you're charging a fee for, uh, this is where this would come in. And, you know, and it's really looking at protecting you know, the, the property rights of everyone around as, as well as the property itself. Because you know, if, if you, for, for instance, if you, uh, you have a house in a neighborhood and the next door, the, the house next door becomes the party house and you know, someone's having these big weddings and events all the time, that might not allow you to, to have your, your, your peacefulness and happiness in your own house. So this is an attempt to balance all the concerns, to recognize, however, on, uh, you know, particularly for weddings, you know, it, used, it used to be that it was a cookie cutter way that people did weddings. Now, you know, the world has changed. People want to do out, outdoor events. They're very popular. They want to do them in barns. They want to do them in other places. And this, this allows all that. And it, but if you really want to get into the business of doing it, then, then there's, some, there's some guidelines that you need to follow. So that's essentially it. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am? Um, yes, please, because we can't, uh, we can't hear you. We can, but the rest of the world can't, so. <laughs>
the concept of if you're having weddings per se as a business, as a commercial um, event, that's really, you know, should be under some kind of scrutiny. But if I'm going to have a party um, and have 70 friends over, do I need to come to the town to apply for a regulation? Sure, the chair. Only if you had them come at least four times and you charge them for coming. I, I wouldn't charge them for yeah, coming. No, but <laughs> an, anyone can have a party or an event at their home. It's only when it becomes an event that you're charging a rental fee for people to come and use your property. Okay, so I could have a lot more people. I'm getting old, and I might want to have a lot of friends. You, you could have as many family weddings as you want. Oh, I, you could I, have as, as many friends. You could have, you know, whatever the event is. The, 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 the only place this comes in is if you started charging for the use of the property. Okay, that, that sounds very fair, and I think you really should have some governance on that because um, I, can, I can see people abusing that is what I'm trying to say. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from town councilors? No? Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, so we will move on to the to uh, item 89, the Thomas Memorial Library electronic use policy. Um, I will ask in advance if there's anybody here that wants to speak to that issue. I guess not. People are getting up, but they're leaving, so. <laughs> All right, then um, I will ask Patty to uh, tell us about this. Okay, happy to. Um, as you know, I'm the liaison to um, the Thomas Morrill Library, um, and on behalf of their board, I will present to you um, their revised um, electronic information services network access policy. Um, and hopefully make a motion to it at the end and, and hopefully you'll agree with the changes they've decided to make after I explain them and approve it. Um, so this has become, let me give you a little background. Um, this policy was last approved um, by the town council in August of 2012. Um, all the changes you see here that are not in red basically were approved by you know, at least four of the members who were here during that time. Um, so you may, perhaps you're already familiar with it. Um, the TML board basically reviews and updates policies as needed or as they are requested by the state library. This particular time um, on this, basically around technology, use of computers, um, the state made um, a contact to the library and said, hey, you need to, let's look at revising some of the wording in your policy, um, and as they did many other libraries. Um, so the board then um, researched um, policies um, throughout Maine and what other, some of the languages are there. They went through many um, iterations of this um, for the places specifically that the State Library looked at and thought they should kind of tighten up some language. And they sought to determine the best language, to pre so basically to protect the library, to protect the town and its patrons. Um, so there's two changes that are here for you that you see that are um, coming that are in red um, to the standing um, policy. The first is under access, and it basically states that the Thomas Memorial Library um, provides um, unrestricted access in the adult library, and that all computers have filters, and that those filter, filters will only be removed um, when someone requests that, and it needs to be somebody who's 17 of age and older, and that's um, 17 is the age that is um, stated by the state. Um, the filters are basically the same filters that they use through the technology department in the schools, and so they would need to be requested to be um, dismantled. Um, second, um, under the limits of use of the technology, um, down on the lower part of this, um, this one just basically says that the material must be saved on hard drive, on thumb drives, excuse me, not hard drives. Obviously, we can't, with 14 computers, they can't handle people saving all the material on there. And as well, if parents who are concerned specifically about children's access to social media, um, that they should directly 
um, supervise their child at the workstation in the children's area. The children's area will never be given permission to um, remove those filters. And if somebody, I mean, kids obviously can go to the library and wander about where they want, but if parents are concerned, they need to be actively part of that. Um, and there's many other things that are in here, but again, those, those, that language was approved in 2012. That's written in black. There won't be, um, there's no proposed changes um, to that. Um, so I guess with that, I will make a motion um, to approve these changes, and we can hopefully then have some discussion. I'm happy to answer. So I will move that we um, approve the Thomas Morello Library um, Electronic Information Services and Network Access Policy with the, the, the two major changes um, that they're proposing here. Thank you very much, Patty, for the um, description mm -hmm. and for the motion. So is there a second? Molly? I'll second that. Thank you very much. Questions, comments for Patty or for anything else in reference to this? Yes, Molly. Um, thank you, Patty, okay. and nicely done. I was on the Library Board of Trustees the last time we made changes to this document, mm -hmm. and you've tightened up the language, or the Board of Trustees Board has done a really nice job with that, and I know that our library director in particular is very concerned about giving people as much access and freedom of information or freedom of access to information as possible, but I think we've come up with the right balance in the use of the filters. Um, I like this policy and I like it better than what we came up with three years ago. So okay. kudos to the library board. Okay, thank you. Jamie. Yeah, under the, uh, this policy in the adult section, can people access social media? Yes. So the filters are, if anybody, if there's something there that they can't find, they can, if they're an adult over 17, right. they can ask the staff to remove those filters okay. and really access anything that's out there. Except, I mean, there, there's rules that are, that you're not supposed to ask, access illegal material. Certainly, if that's, you know, if somebody finds someone's doing that, right. um, they would then pursue that. But um, generally, someone would be free to um, research you know what's there. Right. There's no type of limit to that. Okay. Other questions? No? Okay. Then all in favor? Great. Um, then we will move on to item 90, which is the center line on Fort Williams Park entrance road. Is there anybody here that wants to speak to the council about this? Yes, sir? Good evening, my name is uh, Wynn McLaughlin. My wife and I live on Cranbrook Drive. We are uh, new residents of Cape Elizabeth. We've only lived here for 41 years. Uh, for the last four years, I've had a dog, uh, and I take him just about every day to the fort to exercise him. And I've become aware that the road into the fort is narrow, windy, and dangerous. Um, I think that when people enter the fort, they are taken aback by the vast beauty of the ocean and the islands, and they don't look where they're driving and drive more to the left than the right. Um, so last year, after a couple of near misses, I've asked uh, Ms. the Public Works Commissioner about this. He sent an email up to him. Mr. McGovern uh, requested a solid line be painted in the road to alert drivers of where they should be staying and the request uh, stop there. Um, I talked to one of the employees at the park and was told that the park entrance initially was only one way. So now you've got a, nine, a narrow winding road that's two ways. It may have been narrower when it was one way, but still the the danger exists. And this year I had another near miss, uh, so I re put in another request. That's my concern. I think it's a common sense measure to divide the road. I don't really care what the rules are. I don't, it's, it seems irrelevant whether you put in two solid yellow lines or one solid yellow line. Where I live on the road, you have one solid uh, yellow line. It's a private road. Maybe we're breaking the law. It, it works. So that's my request. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Um, I will ask uh, Jessica to um, maybe comment on this because I believe you were con contacted about this issue. I'm sorry, what? You were contacted yeah. about this issue? Yeah. Um, yes, uh, uh, Chairman Ray. Yes, um, I ran into uh, Dr. McLaughlin in Fort Williams, and he was telling me about his several near misses recently at Fort Williams. And <clears throat> so, uh, given that you know we have a lot more traffic, um, and that you know it was still a concern of his, I thought it was worth looking at bringing to the full council for some discussion. I talked to. Uh, Bob Malley, our public works director, and um, there is, uh, there has been a, an ad hoc, if you will, opinion by a traffic um, engineer, but there's never been a study. Um, I don't, I'm not aware that we have any other complaints about this from any other citizen, but I thought given that um, Mr. M Dr. McLaughlin has expressed concerns on several occasions that it was worth taking a little bit more of a look at. So I think probably I'll ask the town manager to take it from here. Thank you. Uh, Jessica. Thank you. Through, through the chair. Yeah, you know, it, <coughs> Dr. McLaughlin's points, you know, I think anyone who drives that road understands them. Uh, it, it, it is very narrow. It, it is curvy. Uh, you, you, when people drive in that road, they are scaring off in every, every different direction. And, you know, as someone who, who drives in there a lot, I've felt uncomfortable at, at times, so I understand that. The, the, the difficulty is with, with the proposed solution, and, and that is that, you know, we have to look at the, the Uniform Traffic Code standards, and the Uniform Traffic Code standards first don't allow a single yellow line, and then if, if it's a double yellow line, it has to meet certain standards for, for traffic, certain, certain other standards that this does not appear to meet. The, this particular road, if you did put a center line down it, the, the, our biggest worry is, you know, that right, right now, be, you know, it, it's kind of counterintuitive uh, that be, because it is narrow and because there isn't the line, it tends to be a traffic calming device. Uh, people tend to go slower than they otherwise do. The, the, the issue is, and I think you see it on Old Ocean House Road now, where one lane is narrower than the other, uh, is if, if you go down that narrow lane, uh, that narrower lane, it's, you, you tend to zoom, you know, it, it's like a, you know, like a chute almost. And if, if you're walking along there, you don't feel at all comfortable because the cars are a lot more close to where the people are walking. And, you know, and so the concern is if, if you put one at Fort Williams, uh, what you're gonna, what you'd have, is people zooming faster uh, because they feel more comfortable. This is my lane. This is my protected area. When in fact there isn't as much room there. You know, one of the the real issues with Fort Williams is, you know, it's you know that was built in 1978 and it was built as two way. That was the this was built as the main entrance in and out of the park. But you know, at the time that was built. We didn't have the pedestrians that we have now. And what you, what you have is, is the sidewalk, that there's no separation between the sidewalk and the roadway. And by putting a line or something, that exacerbates that problem even more by particularly the cars going in are gonna be right on top of the sidewalk. If, if, there's, if there's actually, you know, you, you, these lanes would be so narrow that it would give people too much confidence. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, and I'm not saying immediately, but I think it's something that the Fort Williams Advisory Commission needs to look at. And, you know, in, in my, my longer term, you know, sense is what, it, if we had someone come in and look at and study it, what would probably end up doing is, is maybe widening the road just a little bit. You don't want to do it too much because it costs people speed. You don't want speed, the people speeding in the park. But then separating the pedestrian traffic with some sort of separation from the road. And while it's not directly addressing Dr. McLaughlin's point, you know, I think it, it does address, it does, you know, it, it needs to be looked at longer term. But I, I don't think putting a center line is, is the answer, you know, based on, based on the, the traffic codes and the, the engineering standards that we have we're required to follow. Thank you, Michael. Molly? Michael, has that road been, Two-way traffic since 1978. Have yes, we ever since it opened. 
thought about making it one way, and I know it's not convenient, but it might be safer, and might we consider looking at that as part of the process? The issue of making it one way is where do you send the traffic out of the park? Right. And you'd we have two entrances, right? Yeah, but you'd send it out in another out. location where people like the fact that there's no cars, no traffic, they can walk their dogs, they can do all those things. And the, the, you know, I think the, the attempt in, it used to be that you came in the old main gate mm -hmm. and vehicles came right through the center of the park right. and the, the council in, from the 1976 study didn't want to have that happen anymore. They said, let's channel all the traffic in the cars in this one area and have the rest of it to be enjoyable as a park, not controlled by cars. I don't disagree with that theoretically because I like that stretch myself. I think that's particularly pretty. But I'm also uh, concerned about the safety issue. And um, I do think it's worth looking at or asking the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to take a look at the broader issue of how we address safety and traffic. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and if it, I think they should look at it, but I'm also, I'm not sure. I think this needs to be prioritized with all of the other their priority needs. Yeah. I, I don't. I you know. I don't think we ought to say it needs to be done. It needs to be done tomorrow. Hmm. That, but they needed to add it to their list of things to be done. Caitlin, what is the level of safety concern? How many accidents are we talking about? How many people have been hit? How many cars have collided? Sergeant Fenton isn't here for the purpose. Do you remember any accidents on the Ford entrance road? And how long have you been a sergeant and not police department? I've been with an officer? I've been an officer for 18 years. Hmm. 18 years, yeah. And I, do you remember any, Bob? No, but you know, but I've said before, you know, something could happen and it happens. So right, well, you know, it hasn't happened. That was my point is that we've gone this long without anything in, in creating change, like putting a center line, which creates a narrower path. I mean, if the concern is people are looking at views, whether you have a yellow line, two yellow lines, a dotted line, polka dots on the ground, it's not going to stop people from looking up at the views. So that doesn't eliminate that problem. It only pushes people closer to the sidewalk. We only have a problem when people have two, two lanes going at the same time, which does not happen all the time. Right. You put a lane in there, you now are forcing traffic on the edges every time a vehicle is driving. So I'm just saying it's creating more of a safety issue than what we have now, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Jamie? I, I particularly like the idea of separating the pedestrian walkway from the road. Mm -hmm. I think that has probably the, the best chance of success. I don't know if there's a room for it, because I know some places there mm -hmm. it comes right up against rock, right. but that, that's certainly worth, worthy of looking at. Patty? I'll just quickly say, I, I think I um, agree that I think there is a concern somewhat. I think the concern that there are people and dogs and cars going all over the place is, um, is real, uh, although nothing's happened. So I, I think I would agree with Mike that maybe this could be on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission's list and priorities and at least at some point get addressed and looked at if there's a, a feasible solution. Anyone else? Okay. I just one last thought. Yes, Jamie. Uh, uh, it, I understand and appreciate the point that there hasn't been accidents there, but the fact that the, the good doctor and other people probably have felt a lot of stress in the park due to cars coming too close to you and your misses, just like uh, you know the corner of Cumbies and Scott Dyer, seen a lot of near misses there. Haven't seen a lot of accidents. I have seen one, um, but that doesn't mean that you know, we shouldn't look at it from a safety perspective. There have been a lot of accidents there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay. Great. Then we will move on to item 91, which is an update on the council goal related to mediation. Is there anybody here that would like to speak to that? No, seeing none. Uh, Caitlin, would you like to uh, update us on this? Sure. Um, we put together a work group that um, we met four separate times to talk about the idea of creating a mediation program here in Cape Elizabeth to help neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor issues, issues with the code enforcement, issues with the planning board. We talked about whether it would be voluntary, mandatory. We, we went down a lot of different holes and vetted out a lot of different thoughts. And then we were very fortunate to have 
Elaine Bourne from the director of the Volunteers of America and Karen Grout, the director of Opportunity Alliance, join us at a meeting. And they enlightened us immensely as to what the options were that were already available to Cape Elizabeth citizens that we didn't need to recreate the wheel. So we came up with um, the following recommendations based on our conversation with them that we could um, put up resources such as posters and brochures around town uh, uh, informing people of these mediation services which are free or at a very nominal amount of money. Um, we also would ask that the town put a link on the website to their um, websites allowing people to get further educated about the, the, the for the most part, free mediation services available to our community. Um, the directors of both um, programs offered to come to one of the um, department heads staff meetings and inform the department heads of the process, the, the, the programs and all the mediation services that are available that they could then be better informed to inform citizens and their own staff. And then we also came up with a, um, a new practice that we could implement um, asking the police and code enforcement and any other applicable departments to begin using a referral process. And um, Elaine and Karen were very informative in telling us that the, the police in other communities will actually refer them citizens' names if there's a neighbor to neighbor issue and it's really not a police issue the police can take their name, give it to Opportunity Alliance or Volunteers of America, and they will reach out and be like, how can I help you? We have all these programs available. You can come on board or you can't. It's just a matter of giving information to our community. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, uh, I guess I'm going to ask if you want to make a motion to receive the report. Sure. I move that the town council receives the report. Thank you. Is there a second? Jamie? Thank you. Discussion? Molly? Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. Yeah, my understanding, the intent of that motion is to implement the report, to implement the recommendations. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, I would okay. guess. I, Usually I, received, it yeah, doesn't imply other than we got it, but yeah, I, guess, I, I just want to double check that the yes. intent is to, okay. That would be my intent. Okay, same. Uh, yes, I had a similar comment and concern, and I also wanted to ask a couple of questions, including um, a question for Michael about the uh, potential for putting some kind of a link on the town website that would offer access to that kind of information. Have you given any thought to what that might be or where that might go? And I only ask because um, last time we had a conversation about putting a link on the town website, I was surprised at some of the response from the council members that we weren't particularly interested, although that was something specific that would send information to us directly. Do you see any issues with putting a link on town website? Easy? Okay. <laughs> Good. And uh, process for getting things like um, brochures into we had talked about it at the time into the library, into the police station. Um, I'm not sure where else we might do it. You said the neighborhood association, schools, places of faith, mm. just to list a few. Mm. Uh, you know, quite you know, I look at this, the council says do it, we do it. Perfect. That's, that's simple. Okay. To me, it seems like there's no cost on any of this. I mean, these brochures are available through these organizations. We just have to distribute them yeah. to me. And to make a link it would make sense. It would probably be most things. People go to the code enforcement area, and that's when they're having problems with rules. I mean, to me, it would make complete sense to implement these. Easy. Easy. I think Jamie had his hand up. No. No, you did not. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jessica? Yep. I was wondering if um, in your uh, recommendation number four, requesting a new practice by the police code enforcement have you vetted this with them are they on board i mean if we're going to recommend a brand new practice by our departments I, I hope they've been included in the discussion well ben mcdougall was um included in all of our meetings and he definitely did not oppose the idea he welcomed any problem solvings 
that could happen before he arrived, and it seemed to be a, to me, a no-brainer for the police if they can get problems solved where they're not having to solve problems. Um, but no, we did not. I don't remember. We did not reach out to the police department because at the time we didn't see it being um, harmful to them in any way. Just. You know, Ben gave an update on at the department head meeting on this, and everyone, you know, sort of nodded, okay, okay. Uh, you know, I, he's. I think Ben's enthusiastic about it, and I think that carries through. The, the police department, you know, does this type of thing all the time, as well. Uh, you know, you know there, there are always going to be a few issues that still come to the council, uh, but you know, a, you know, 90% of the issues get mediated anyway. It's the other 10% that that you folks see. Other comments? No? Jessica, I'm sorry. Yeah, I looked at the links um, for these organizations, and I just, um, with volunteers of, well, I know it's America, it says American twice here, but I'm sure it's American. But anyway, I looked at those links, and I, under the Volunteer of America link, I could not find um, the, the link within that website to a mediator or mediation. I could on uh, the Opportunity Alliance, although I had to dig a little for it, um, but I couldn't on Volunteer for America. So my comment would be, I mean, if that could get looked at, um, it's not, at least when I went on, it wasn't readily available or obvious. It looked a lot more like direct <clears throat> counseling, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of benef uh, a lot of programs for vulnerable populations, that sort of thing, and I could not find a neighbor to neighbor mediation or anything like that. So there, we, that may need to be flushed out a little bit. Maybe it's there, and I just didn't see it. Yeah, it we'll, we'll just ask Wendy to uh, there is a work our webmaster to yeah. make sure the the link we the links we do have need to be yeah. pointing pointing at what they need to point at. So. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to, you know, to put this with a link to our town website, we certainly want it to be very easy for people to identify to that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? All right, all in favor? Great. Um, then we'll move on to item 92. Um, I assume nobody's here to talk about fee updates. That's me. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, I mean uh, public people. No, okay, Michael. Yeah, I, I just want to go over these because one, one I actually have a correction on. Uh, you know, the, the these are various odds and ends of fees. This came about because we we brought I forget the fee. We brought some fee to the council a few months back, and the council sort of raised their eyebrows when they saw that some of the fees hadn't been looked at in quite a quite a few years. So we ended up looking at all the different fees, and the the single page you have before you is just uh, the, the summary of the ones that are recommended to be changed. They, you know, right now, if, if you want a birth, marriage, or death certificate, you don't want it certified, there isn't a fee. It's proposed to be a $5 fee. If you want to hire the police, public works, or uh, uh, fire department, it's proposed that the, the hourly rate go up $5 for police and fire, $10, if, if five, uh, $5 for each of them. Uh, we don't now charge for the disposal of fluorescent light tubes. We do have a cost that it takes us to get rid of it. It's proposed 25 cents per foot for U-shaped CFLs. CFL, CFLs? Yeah, CFLs. Uh, there should be a little less there. Uh, 50 cents each. Uh, the cemetery fees, haven't, as you can see, haven't gone up uh, for the most part since 2007, proposing to increase those. The, the sewer user fee, uh, the, that actually, that's the one I want to mention. Even though the, the other fees are recommended to be effective September 1, 2015, the recommendation that be effective 3-1-2016. Uh, we've been increasing them incrementally every year by, by 2 to 3 percent so that we keep up with the capital needs or whatever. And so it, it was, it's just we wanted to do this when we did the other, when we were looking at the other fees. But there is not the immediate revenue need in, within the sewer fund to have that happen. So the point is, is to get it lined up. And so the, that recommendation is 3 one uh, The sewer appeal fee hadn't been changed in 1978. It's proposed to increase that to uh, $200. Street opening fee up 
uh, to $75, the driveway entrance permit fee up to $75, increase of $25 and $30 respectively. And this Sperling Church fee has hadn't been looked at it to, since 2007, and it's proposed to increase uh, those fees for most rentals approximately $50 uh, per use. We don't want to raise them too much because, uh, you know, as we we're talking about special events, there's a lot of competition out there now. Uh, so we don't want to drive people away from the, using the facility. So I'd recommend that you approve those fees. Okay. Is there a motion? As, to, as pre, is, is, to be effective September 1, with the exception of the sewer fees, March 1, 2016. And I just want to clear for the Spurwing Church, this is for rentals made after September 1. If someone has made a rental, you know, already, and okay. it's during this period, we're not going to go back and charge them the extra amount. Thank you, Michael. Is there a motion to accept the fee changes, fee updates? Jessica? I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? Patty? I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion, questions from Mike? Molly? One quick comment. Um, I'm glad we finally looked at these, and some of these haven't been looked at for eight years. That's a long time. But having said that, I think the increases are incredibly modest and very reasonable. And I'm in favor. Great, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, all in favor? All right. Uh, item 93, carry forward amounts. Take one, pass one. Thank you. I'm, I'm handing this out uh, by paper, uh, although I handed one too many. Oops, sorry. Uh, we'll simple, share. Yeah, we'll share. Uh, simply because I want to make sure that, be absolutely sure, because, you know, this, this one first went out over a week ago. And there are a couple of changes, and I just want to make sure that everyone is looking at the same list. Uh, a carry forward balance is, is what is designated to be carried forward from one year to the next. We also use it as an opportunity to look at a whole, to look at where we stand with, with revenues, with expenditures, and to look at things that the council had talked about funding or talked about doing or had a goal, but there didn't seem to be any money to accomplish it. So let, let me briefly give you the categories of which these fit in so you, you're clear about what's, what's new and what isn't. Records preservation is a simple carryover. The, the implementation of uh, uh, the geographic information system is a simple carry forward. Family Fund Day is, is, is a little uptick over the money in the account, and that is intended to keep the level of activity for Family Fund Day in 20. 16 that we had in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm that if things were upgraded this year and uh, just to try to keep that momentum going. I don't, the 250th anniversary committee uh, is, th there's not quite that amount, but that's just to be sure that if this concert, it, right now it's not going to break even, but we expect that it will break even. It, you know, it, it, uh, it's just to, to make sure we close that out and have proper safeguards. Uh, Stonewall repair, that's a simple carry forward. Police cruises carry forward. Roadway drainage repairs, sidewalks are carry forward. The town hall meeting, the library project, the original library building, that's a carry forward. Uh, town hall meeting space, office space plans. This is, we, we were going to be doing some work up front, but a lot of it got diverted to, to downstairs here. This is to return to looking at that office space there. That hasn't been uh, upgraded in a long, long time. Uh, the extrication tool, I've spoken to the chief, fire chief, that's been carried forward twice. I've told them it's not going to be carried forward again, if they're, they're really going to buy it this year or not. Uh, athletic field, uh, electrical upgrades are carried forward. Uh, the recycling center study is to make sure we have funds to complete the study uh, that's underway uh, right now. Uh, the fuel donation account, that's the money in the account donated. The library trustees have, have asked for a, a library generator transfer switch so that if we have put in a generator in the future, that the, this switch would have been built into the electrical. The, build, the building committee didn't want to pay for a, a uh, generator, and it's, and it's been a point of contentious, contention back and forth. The, the library trustees are really want to see this happen, at least get the switch in. So I'm recommending we put the money to the switch without it impacting the library budget. 
it doesn't impact the library budget at all. So that's what that one is okay. trying to keep everyone happy. <laughs> uh, there's no monies available when the library moves back to the old building to rehab for some purpose the old Spurwing School building. This is to, to pay for planning and renovation. And again, you know, I've had some discussions with Meredith. The schools might have some need for it. Uh, but, you know, we, we just can't move out and, and just leave it if, if, you know, if it's to be repurposed, reused per the council goal. It's going to take some money. Uh, front end loader replacement. This is when you approve the capital budget. There was a million dollars in listings and there was only 950,000 available and we said that 50,000 of the whole list would, this is 180,000 pieces of equipment, 130 is in the budget. This was the 50,000 that was just left hanging that we said would take care of at this point. Uh, the Richards pool study, this comes out of your finance committee discussion. The, the Dectron unit, all those energy intensive pieces, you've asked for an engineering study, I just got from Greg, uh, they put an ad in the paper for an engineering study. They only got one proposal back. It's like 16750 to do it, so proposing 17000 for that, and the budget use of undesignated surplus is the amount indicated. So that's the explanation of them all. And trout, trout work is a uh, monies that was, was given when the Eastman Meadows was developed to be used for improvements at trout work. It was a, it was a set aside that was part of that that uh, plan to for the trout work uh, mitigation to to bring it back into compliance as a, uh, a good good stream. Any questions for Michael? So the real significant piece here is that I'm really asking you to set aside 150 thousand for the Spurwing School. That's that's the real key, and to pay for this pool study. The rest of it is, I, in my view, minor. You know, but I mean, the, the one that's really new tonight is the Richards Pool study. That is that you have not seen. Molly, you had a question. I do. I, I have no problem with any of those. I think that's great, and I'm glad we're going to plan to do that Richards Pool study. I think it's important. I just have a question on your spreadsheet. The very bottom, the last item says item 755, library project, June yeah. 30th balance. I, which means what we're not giving mean? it any extra more money. It's just, you know, the, the accounts, whatever balances in the accounts on June 30 will be carried forward to get the project done. Okay. There are no additional monies, no, no changes. The right answer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Other questions for Michael? Is there a motion to uh, accept the carry forward amounts? Molly? So moved. Is there a second? Jessica? A second. <clears throat> any further discussion? No? All in favor? Great. And uh, Michael, item 94, mitigation work on combined sewer overflow. Yeah, uh, this particular item, uh, Bob is here. Are you here for, for this one or the next one? Oh, uh, uh, the next one. Okay. So on <laughs> item number 94, uh, the council had a workshop report from uh, the consultant at the June meeting, and they, they've identified $330,000 worth of projects uh, that need to be done this year and next. Uh, you know, it's a lot of that we, we really, we, we in, in order to, to maintain compliance with our license from the DEP, we need to get the, the first uh, tranche of those projects done this year. You know, rather than ask for money this year, ask for money next year, this simply, it's, it's from the sewer fund. Uh, it's, a, it's, I'm asking you to authorize, in essence, 330,000 in, that's, that's in, that was in the workshop plans that you saw, to set it aside in account so that we'll be able to draw on that over the next two years in order to implement that plan. Questions for Michael? Bob's here to answer any detailed questions. Thank you, Bob. You said 330. It says 350 here? Or? Yeah, because the 330 is, is an estimate that was done in a consulting plan in year one, and, you know, we still have, it's going to happen over two years, and I, you know, I, I just think 350 is, is a more accurate estimate. And it also, I'm not, that did not include all of, you know, 
it, there's always more engineering work in, in Cape, and particularly in Cape Elizabeth, you know, we, we need to make sure we have an active citizen outreach plan and be, you know, people can have lots of issues and questions and some of them are going to require engineering work to, to go and to, to help, help them figure out what they need to do without actually doing the work. But, uh, so I, I think 350 is an accurate, more accurate assessment. Thank you, What's Mike. Is there a motion to um, allocate the 350000 for the sewer user fund? Jessica? I, I so move. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second that. Patty, thank you. Any further discussion? I just have a quick question, Holly? maybe for Bob. Have, do we have any update on, so on um, citizen comments or compliance or any other feedback we've had from folks affected? Not yet. Uh, what we thought with this phase one project was we needed to add infrastructure to enable those connections uh, or to help uh, alleviate those illicit connections. We thought step one we should be is get the infrastructure in place, then we can work with the citizens on the I and I removal process so we'd have the infrastructure in place to make those connections rather than working with the citizens first before the infrastructure was in place. And can you just refresh my memory what the plan is to um, encourage those folks to comply? Um, I think because, the, because there are some people, I think, who will be affected. And, yes. and while, as I remember in our presentation last month, generally there were no big numbers. Right. Um, there might be a few folks who needed to do something more that might get pricey. Yeah, some of the ranges in the remediation range from five hundred dollars to, you know, more than that, fifteen thousand or more. Exactly. But I, Mike and I have discussed some type of deferral or waiver of a sewer user fee to help ease the pain on that. We haven't provided details to the council yet, but that was sort of our initial thought that that might be a good process to work with. Great. I'm glad to hear that you're working on that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions for Michael or for Bob? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all in favor then? Great. And then uh, we will go to item 95, the lease amendment for the Spurwink Road pump station. Uh, Michael, I guess we start with you. Yeah, th thank you, Chairman Rick. It, if you, you're down on Spurwink Avenue, you've got the treatment plant on one side of the road. On the other side of the road, you have what, what used to be the treatment plant which is a small brick building, yeah. and that's now a pump station. Uh, the, the, the water district is here. They can answer far more details. But the, the, the land that the treatment plant is on and the pump station on, we, we gave a long-term lease to the Portland Water District of, I believe it was 50 years, in order to, to redo that pump station and to build the treatment plant. Uh, you know, like like any leases, you know, you you look at them over time. That lease was negotiated in 1985, 86. Uh, you know, right now the, the district has got some drainage issues around that pump station. They want to put a drainage line uh, that goes goes out into the marsh. They've been working with Ben on it, working with the DEP on it, but it is part of. It's not within the leased area, uh, so this would simply. Ex amend this provision would allow us to amend that lease to accommodate this drainage line uh, to go out to go out into the marsh uh, it, it would be the same it would expire at the same time as the, as the rest of the lease it's just an amendment to that lease that uh, takes care of the drainage line you know and it, it's a little bit complicated this this you know if, like the land trust also has a has a lease on part of that property over there but it's not, when, when that was negotiated, we specifically said stay away from the area around here because we, we might, we never know what we might have to do. Mm -hmm. This is an example of what we might have to do sometime. So, so what I'm asking for is an authorization to uh, <clears throat> amend the lease to uh, provide uh, sufficient room to install and to maintain uh, this uh, drainage line. Is there a motion to do so? Patty? Moved. Thank you. Is there a second? second? Thank you. Caitlin? Any further discussion? Questions? Jamie? Is there any objections that you've heard? 
No, it's, you know, Ben's been involved, Maureen's been involved, Bob's been involved, DP's been involved, a lot of districts been involved. The lawyer will soon be involved if we don't actually have the, the written lease amendment yet, but we'll get that done uh, shortly so we can get the work done. You plan to do this pretty quick? Uh, yes. Yeah, like tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before, before snow flies, okay. Before the snow flies, okay. Let's hope that's not tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. Any other questions? Okay, all in favor? Great. Um, so the next item is citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda. The only citizen I see is Bob Malley. Do you want to say anything? <laughs> okay, there we go. Uh, yes, Molly. Can I ask a question as sure. a citizen? You're a citizen. Um, we are still receiving lots of emails about cell service in town. And Michael, do you have any update for us on where we're at? No, as you know, the you know the last we heard from John Wall is that. He was expecting a decision, you know, by the end of August. So it's, there's no update beyond that. Okay. You know, and then I sent you. Uh, there was another filing, uh, you know, recently, and I, I sent you a copy of that. And we've been res to all the citizens have been getting the a fairly standard response saying the council will look at this when uh, the lawsuit, uh, the federal court lawsuit, right. is decided, and then. If the, if the town loses the case, the council will decide whether or not to appeal. If the town wins the case, it will still come back to the council because you, you've agreed overall to look at the policy. Right. Great. Right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? Comments? No. All right, then I will um, entertain a motion to adjourn. Jamie? So moved. Thank you. Anybody? I, <clears throat> I'll second. Jessica? Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments about that? No? All right. All in favor? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.